In this video, we'll be starting a new module, Module 8, Applying Chemical Ideas. This is going to be the first lesson on monitoring the environment. Here is our syllabus dot point, analyze the need for monitoring the environment. And so why do we monitor the environment? Well, environmental chemistry has large analytical components where we seek to understand the processes by which elements and compounds are transformed in nature. Some of the environmental implications for which we need to better understand environmental chemistry include issues revolving around global warming, as well as the natural habitat of flora and fauna. Socially, there are effects on people's health as a result of the environment they reside in, and also the availability of food and clean drinking water. So what are the main points which we'll be looking at for monitoring the environment? In the air, we want to monitor the oxides of carbon, sulfur and nitrogen as part of the natural elemental cycles of Earth and also that of the halogenated alkanes which may cause issues such as ozone depletion. In the soil and water, we monitor phosphate levels, pH, something called the softness or the hardness of water which is uh, contributed to by calcium and magnesium ions, and also the heavy metals in the water. So what are the cycles of matter? Well, the cycles of matter refer to elemental cycles including the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, and the sulfur cycle. The monitoring of these cycles helps to remind us that the interchange of matter leads to the conservation of those types of matter. Now where do these cycles occur? Well, they have interchanges which happen in different spheres. We have the geosphere, which is soil and rock, the hydrosphere, which is water, we have atmosphere, the biosphere, and finally we have the anthrosphere, which we may be less familiar with, and that refers to us. Now carbon is a key element of biological systems, and in particular carbon dioxide. Now the complete combustion of a fuel will lead to the development of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide we know is a greenhouse gas and that contributes to global warming. Meanwhile, incomplete combustion is going to produce carbon monoxide, CO, which is a highly toxic gas and also carbon or soot, which is a known carcinogen. Here we have a diagram of the flow of carbon dioxide through the carbon cycle. As we can see, the numbers in red represent anthrogenic sources of carbon dioxide, so these are sources which come from us, and in yellow is the natural source of CO2. And this is also given in billions of tons per year. As we can see, there is 9 billion tons of carbon dioxide which is being produced by anthrogenic sources per year. We can tell that there's a large excess which is produced by human emissions, and this is predominantly by the burning of f fossil fuels. And not surprisingly, we have seen that there's been an increase in global warming as a result. Sulfur exists in nature in a wide variety of compounds. The combustion of fossil fuels will produce sulfur dioxide, which is a respiratory irritant. But the main issue is that it contributes to acid rain formation, and that's given by this equation over here. Some of the implications of this include the acidification of waterways, so we have decrease in the pH of the waterways, which can lead to the aquatic organism death, and in particular, large-scale damage to vegetation in forests. And we can see that over here on the image to the right. This is a forest which has been damaged by acid rain, and as we can see, all of the greenery has since disappeared from it. Nitrogen is abundant in the atmosphere in the form of N2 gas, but it can be oxidized through combustion of fossil fuels to give us NO and NO2. Now, similar to sulfur dioxide and uh, sulfur oxide, NO and NO2 is going to produce acid rain, which is going to give us the same kind of issues with damage towards forests. But the main issues of oxides of nitrogen is that it's a major contributor to the issue of photochemical smog, which is a large-scale production of ozone, as well as other closely related secondary pollutants. Here we can see on the right-hand side is an image of what photochemical smog would look like. Now, anthropogenic nitrogen has risen to almost twice that of natural amounts over the years. And an issue with that is that nitrogen is a source that promotes algal growth, also known as eutrophication, which we will talk about later on. Now, halogenated alkanes come from a variety of sources, including fire extinguishers, aerosol propellants, and also come from solvents used in chemical reactions being disposed of. Unfortunately, the issue comes when these halogenated alkanes have not been processed appropriately. That's going to lead to respirational air. Water can either be categorized as being soft or hard, and this is not in relation to the feel of the water. 
Now hardness is usually caused by the presence of calcium and magnesium ions in water, while the other metals such as sodium or magnesium can also contribute. This means that softer water is going to be water which is lacking in the presence of metal ions. Now there are different uses for the two types of water. Hard water is better for drinking, but it produces scum when it's used with soap, and it's also harsher on the skin because the metal ions which exist within it clog up your pores. Softer water is going to be better to be used with soap, but it's going to damage pipes due to its low pH and its high corrosiveness. Now heavy metal ions are predominantly going to be lead and mercury ions, but they can also include platinum ions. The sources of these heavy metals can include mining, smelting, and electroplating facilities or batteries. Since the solubility of these metals increases in acidic water, the production of acid rain can be particularly bad for the dissolution of these heavy metals. And the result of having these dissolved metals in water and being ingested is that they can accumulate in aquatic organisms which are then consumed by humans, causing us to have severe health implications such as brain, hearts, and lung problems. Now the result of these dissolved mercury salts will present the highest danger because the ions are highly toxic. Here's a diagram of ingestion which comes from the accumulation of heavy metals in aquatic organisms which are then consumed by humans. So we start off with the inorganic mercury, which is then turned into organic mercury, which is then consumed by plankton in the water, which is then consumed by fish of greater and greater size. Now unlike carbon, nitrogen or sulfur, phosphorus has no stable gaseous form. And so all sources of phosphorus must be endogenic, meaning that they come from the earth. So these sources include fertilizer, feed for livestock, animal waste, and detergents in waste runoff. Phosphate is also a type of nutrient, like nitrogen, for the promotion of algal growth in waterways. And like we said, that is going to be called eutrophication. Now because of the low solubility of phosphorus and the slow leaching of this substance from inorganic substances, our current use of phosphorus is rather unsustainable. 85% of our reserves come from the guano reserve which makes up the land form in Nauru, but this has since been largely exhausted. If you did not know, guano is essentially bird dung. However, we have been overcoming this through the development of man-made fertilizers, but a result of this has been the increase of the rate of phosphate cycling by up to four times, and thus the number of point source phosphate releases and eutrophications has similarly increased. Now eutrophication is an event in which there is an excess of algal growth as a result of an excess of nitrogen or phosphorus nutrients. Now eutrophication is an event in which there is an excess of algal growth as a result of an excess of available nitrogen or phosphorus. This may come from a large variety of sources which we previously mentioned like fertilizer runoff or sewerage. And this issue has been apparent in largely populated areas where there's been an interference with food production. Even the Great Barrier Reef has since been affected by eutrophication as a result of continuous development in the area. One of the issues is that the algal growth remains on the top of the water, such as this image on the right hand side, where all of this is water which is covered in algae. And this reduces sunlight penetration in the water to prevent things like photosynthesis happening with other plants which are in the water, and also hindering the predator's ability to seek and catch prey. Now the issue of eutrophication is so bad that an excess of oxygen consumption will lead to what we call dead zones in the aquatic environment. These are anaerobic zones in which the water will have no oxygen, leading to the death of aquatic organisms when either they cannot breathe or the algae becomes trapped in their gills. While it might seem confusing that algae would consume oxygen when they are photosynthesizing, they undergo a process of cellular respiration which consumes the oxygen when they die and decay. Now a problem with the algae decomposing is that first, while they taint the drinking water supply, not necessarily having to die, but then when they do die, they're going to regenerate CO2, which is going to contribute to our global warming. And then we're going to have anaerobic or anoxic bacterial degradation happening in the water. 